Welcome to another episode of Two Ales and Hockey Tales with Wally. And today I'm so excited to have on, I think he's still 26, from Clarenville, Newfoundland, Canada. His hockey journey has taken him to Canada, Scotland, Germany, Sweden, Czechia, Romania, Norway, and the chocolatey Manchester Storm of England. He is a global YouTube sensation and... His look into the chocolate storm shelter has already been watched thousands of times, and he just released it last night. Letting the world know all about our chocolate throwing fun, he is a returning shed guy when we met back on episode 333, when he had just finished running a muck of the chocolate storm shelter, and he is having fun all over the hockey world, and he calls it working. Welcome back to the shed, Robert Greeley. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And I will say it's cool to see how you've built a community with your shed because after we chatted when I was in Strasbourg, I think the next like three or four stops I ran into fellow shed guys. So really? know, Cody Lampo out in uh in Straubing there with the uh with the Germany Dell League. So yeah, it's uh good for you. It's um yeah, I honestly I'm way more connected in the hockey world than I ever was as a player. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's fun every time. And, uh, you know, I get into how we know each other. You had came on when you had just been to Manchester and I'm a sponsor of the team. <laughs> and we had, I had you on, we discussed your trip and everything you got going on. Man, you are a busy boy. eh? Yeah. I mean, I like to keep busy, you know, uh, 26 still, like you said in the intro. So, you know, just trying to soak up all that youth and get as much done as I can before, uh, I'm sitting in a chair at, at 75. Well, I tell you, when you say it's a cool community I've built, I saw one of your videos has been watched 67,000 times. <laughs> That's bananas. Yeah. I mean, it, it still is pretty cool. You know, I think sometimes with social media, you think of like numbers just being inflated that, you know, everything, if it's not a million views attached to it, then it's kind of a bust. But you know, growing up in a small town of like 6,000 people, you know, just to kind of see that like a video now is like 11 times the size of technically where I grew up, you know, it's always uh, pretty cool and humbling every time you see it. Yeah, that's neat, man. Cause like, I think it's cool. Just a few hundred listen to me talk in my shed each time. Right. And I'm like, wow, that's weird. But man, how many people are viewing your stuff is like, so you sent out the Manchester video last night. And when I just looked, it was already over 2,300 views. Yeah, I mean, props to the United Kingdom fan base. They're, you know, pouring in from all over, you know, which is great to see. It's always nice, too, when you kind of get groups from other fan bases kind of tuning in. You know, a lot of people cheering for Belfast in the comments section. Um, Sheffield as well, too, seeing a lot from, from their fan group, right? So it's always cool that, you know, there definitely seems to be a longing for this type of content, especially within the uh, United Kingdom League. And so... Even though my time there was short, at least if I can kind of scratch that itch for some of the fan groups, you know, I'm more than happy to do so. I uh, think it's very neat what you're doing, and I appreciate it because um, I'm not really sure what all we talked about last time. But, like, I did live that life in Germany, in the UK, in Denmark, and nobody really knew what I was doing over there, right? There wasn't this type of platform where people really see what European hockey's like, right? Yeah, well, every time you kind of open up the app, there always seems to be a new type of update. And, you know, the world's more connected now than ever. I mean, even just looking at some of my lifetime viewerships and getting to see, you know, YouTube is great for the analytics side, right? So actually getting to see who and where and, and what people are watching in the world, especially like on my uh, content, you know, just uh, being able to reach all these different uh, groups is is really incredible, right? Why it is, and um, like you talked about the UK fan base, they're they're as passionate as people get. That's my honey hole. I mean, for my listeners, it's like over seventy percent from the UK, and um, I think it's I think it's so cool that it's such a budding hockey environment, and they have such a great culture. I think it's it was the funnest league I played in because you know. Not everybody was still chasing the NHL dream. Everybody went over there because they loved hockey. They wanted to keep doing what they loved. And it wasn't about the money. It was about playing hockey. Yeah. And, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with buddies of mine throughout the years. And one thing that's like really 
like, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to everything, but one thing that's really consistent with everybody's messaging who goes over and plays in that league is, you know, it's always pretty much resounding positive remarks, right? There's never like, Oh, it was great, but you know what? Yeah. We, this didn't happen or that didn't happen. Um, yeah, you, uh, you got a day job too on top of all this YouTube stuff or no? Yeah. 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 Holy moly, man. <laughs> so it must be flexible that you got to go travel Europe for a while getting all your footage, eh? Well, I actually this is a, a new thing for me. Um, so more or less, you know, this stuff is obviously expensive to do. So really just um wanted to dive deep and you know, keep expanding, make the videos, you know, bigger and better. So basically what I was able to do from that was um yeah, just take a, a your classic nine to five job right after I had done all the Europe stuff. So basically now that, you know, not to get into my personal finances too much, but basically just take the, uh, you know, my annual salary and, and really just invest it back everything into this. So that way, you know, people can just have a better viewing experience and keep watching, you know, just bigger and better content from me. Um, moving you're doing forward, it for right? the love so, and you're, you're making ends meet to get to follow your passion. That's pretty cool. Cause I'm the same. I do this for free. Um, I do it because I love it and I want to talk hockey with hockey guys, you know? No, exactly. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, all this stuff is for the love of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the coolest thing too is, you know, essentially I get to showcase people's passion and, and love for certain things to a, a wider audience. Right. So I mean, it's a blessing that I definitely don't take for granted. And whenever you get the opportunity to really uh, just have your dream provide you with like so much fun. And, you know, there, like I said, it does, you know, bring in a little bit of money, but not enough to to really cover all the expenses. So, yeah, you got to do other things and, and make some sacrifices to uh, to make that work. So, yeah, that's uh, it's what you got to do. And I mean. I love this coaching thing and every year I've got my team shirts, um, two ales and hockey tails shirts with their names and numbers on the back. And I would do raffles to make the money to pay for that. I did sponsor the storm and I am having a raffle at aleshockeytails.com because I still owe the storm money for sponsoring Critch. And I do the logo on the back of his jersey is just the coolest thing ever, especially when he goes out there and runs a muck every game. But I do have to pay them back. So I got a raffle at aleshockeytails.com, folks. Please buy tickets. But I think it's pretty neat that uh, last time I checked, it was over 130 tickets had been sold for a fake hockey team made up of shed guys and gals in my, you know, talking in my shed. <laughs> it's pretty neat no, it's that people buy tickets, right? <laughs> And I will say, I'll give you a little insight into a couple of the shots there. So I know you've noticed because I've seen it on your Instagram story, but there was definitely a couple of lingering moments where the uh, back of Critchlow's jersey was uh, very present in or present in the video. And so that Thank was my you. my Thank you. That was my that was my thanks to you for being uh, as generous <laughs> with your with your time as you are and and doing all these things. Oh man, it, it warms my heart to see that. And then you see how many people are viewing it and they see how much fun the team's having in Manchester when they win and all the chocolate hits the ice. And to know that it started from me and Critch talking in my shed and asking for a storm of chocolate. And then it's just snowballed and snowballed, just like fun does, you know? <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, a lot of these things, you know, it just takes one, right? And so it was funny. Since we chatted, I put out a video that, um, you know, it did really well. So when that ever, when that always happens, you know, there's definitely more people who uh, critique it. But it was the short form version of like, here's, you know, three things that the NHL can do right now to make the game uh, a lot more fun and enjoyable, right? And it was just kind of like low hanging fruit that like easily anybody could look at it and and implement it, right? And so the three points that I made were, you know, have like the designated diehard section as they do in, in Europe for NHL rinks. Have uh, the, in France, in Strasbourg, actually, when a penalty happens or a rule, like they put the rule up on the scoreboard for like, you know, 20 seconds for people to just read and, and understand what's going on, right? And I had that one up there as, as a point, you know, um, I think whenever there's a new person in attendance, you know, a hockey can be a confusing sport. So having those little like, you know, just, just little tweaks to the, to the, your in-game experience can definitely help, uh, you know, just make the, make the experience that much more enjoyable for 
everybody watching. And then the third one was, you know, talking about that post game celebration stuff. You know, it doesn't have to be chocolate, but you know, throwing things on the ice, like having a little celebration and stuff like that. And so there was obviously a lot of feedback from, uh, you know, people watching, which I surely appreciate. I, ironically, the one that seemed to like invoke the most rage out of people was the suggestion to like have the rules up on the scoreboard. And uh, people were basically like, oh, it's, you know, your responsibility to understand the game if you're going. But I'm like, you think of how many people get uh, tickets at work or something like that. Or, you know, a friend of theirs says, hey, I, you know, I, I want a raffle. You want to go to this? And they're not hockey fans. And they go. Think about how much more enjoyable it would be if they're watching. They're like, oh, this is a great atmosphere. And then they also get those little prompts so they can understand it. And I'm all for good debate. And the reason why I stand on that so strongly is because the NFL is – in terms of marketing and everything like that, like they're a, a genius organization in pro sports league. Right. Yeah. And the things that they were doing back in like the, I could get my dates wrong here, but like the sixties and everything like that to structuralize it, it's why when you look at like the Forbes fit top 50, most profitable organizations that like all 30 NFL teams are basically within that top 50. Right. Yeah. And I look at what they've been doing with the Nickelodeon broadcast, right? So they have like SpongeBob commentating the games, but then they're also explaining the rules, right? For kids and a younger audience. I didn't know so that. the NFL has already taken that initiative and they're doing that and having a whole separate broadcast to like help younger fans or anything like that better understand the game. Those little prompts are, you know, whatever it could be for the NHL. It doesn't have to exactly look like that, what was going on in Strasbourg, but it will help you push the needle exponentially and so that's why i kind of stand on on that as as much as i do but yeah i would say getting kids into a sport um whether they play it or are just a fan it can last a lifetime and you know the kids that start watching football they're gonna watch football their whole life but the thing that struck for me there was you said the hardcore section like the fan section that they have in Europe or even like the student section of the NCAA game it, it they are having so much more fun they're letting their hair down and doing whatever they feel like doing and it makes hockey funner and I personally think fans in North America don't actually enjoy the games like they do in Europe. They're not having as much fun. They're worried about whatever we think of them. They don't even really stand up and cheer very much. They just sit there and watch the game. Where in Europe, I mean, I got topless in the crowd, spray painted, and people loved it. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely a sight, I'm sure. But yeah, I think, you know, it's definitely, you know, I mean, there's so much in on this topic alone. But the thing is, too, is it's like, it can, it's achievable in North America. People I mean, you want to should... get rowdy, you know, like there are people that go to hockey games that, that want to bang on drums that want to jump up and down. Right. But people talk about, it and they say like another counter to all this was like, Oh, this won't work in North America. Like they don't care as much. An NFL tailgate. I mean, Bill's mafia, uh, Toronto FC, when they were winning the league in the MLS, like those games were an absolute incredible Experience. atmosphere. I mean, the, yeah. the, the Panda game, Carlton versus U Ottawa in, in Ottawa every year, like those matches have such hype around them. And yeah, I, again, too, like, I think baseline argument of like, you look at any NFL tailgate, there's so much going on. It's like, what do you mean that this can't happen in North America? You need to set up the infrastructure for it to be available. And, you know, you've got to put the investment in. But, I mean, that really is the biggest step. Once you showcase that you're willing to put in the time and the effort and the money, eventually it will come. It's not going to be an overnight thing. You know, you might lose a million dollars your first year. But, I mean, you talk to anybody who has that kind of money. And if they're going to lose a million dollars in the first year, but the indication could be there that, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road, that's going to be a 10 million, hundred million dollar investment. 